Divine Grace, A.C. Bhakti Vedanta, Swami Prabhupada. Translation Whoever is under the influence of Supreme Kala, eternal time, must surrender his most dear life and what to speak of other things such as wealth, honor, children, land, and home. Performed by Srila Prabhupada. A great Indian scientist. Busy in the plan making business, was suddenly called by invincible eternal time while going to attend a very important meeting of the planning commission. And he had to surrender his life, wife, children, house, land, wealth, etc. During the political upsurge in India and its division into Pakistan and Hindustan, so many rich and influential Indians had to surrender life, property, of time. Many poets have written verses lamenting the influence of time. Many devastations have taken place over the universes due to the influence of time and no one could check them by any means. Even in our daily life so many things come and go in which we have no hand but we have to suffer or tolerate them without remedial measure. That is the result of time. Thus ends the Bhakti Vilata Purpur. Om Jnana Timyan Dasya Jnana Janashala Gaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nitinamine Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshacha Tarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gauravakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So this verse is spoken by Vidura. He is specifically addressing Dhritarashtra. Vidura is enlightening Dhritarashtra about the facts of life. Now this instruction by Vidura is equally applicable to all of us because we are living in this world ignorant of the effect of Kala, 
time to actually properly understand what is this kala or what is its influence is not very easy even though we are always conscious of uh, the fact that time is passing we do make uh, some uh, plans for spending time in a proper manner but actually we don't realize the real effect of kala which is a destructive effect the destructive effect of time is what we don't generally realize here uh, vidura is explaining the important effect of kala as something which is destructive he is telling whoever is under the influence of supreme kala kala is supreme because uh, kala overtakes everyone without exception everyone in this world every created being and the creation itself is happening under the influence of kala or time it is kala which dictates cyclically there should be creation maintenance and destruction of this material world we don't realize that not only the entire universe or the entire material cosmic manifestation but also every individual person within this world created being also has to undergo creation maintenance and destruction continuously without any uh, cessation continuously this is going on so uh, people do make some calculations that i have got so much time i can uh, plan to do something according to my own uh, desires but actually kala does not take into consideration all our plans and desires as they say Uh, suddenly death comes almost always death is uh, coming suddenly so therefore here uh, as regards the situation of the trashra vidura is telling that very soon the trashra has to surrender his most dear life among so many things we may have in this material world as our possessions the dear most possession generally for most people is their own life therefore at all costs one tries to actually uh, save oneself especially when there is danger to one's own life then one is willing to sacrifice anything and everything for protecting one's own life in this body what is ironical is that as spirit soul we have no death we don't die we don't perish we are not destroyed as spirit soul but generally most people have got the uh, misconception in terms of i am the body 
Birth in this material world means it is due to this misconception only that I am this body. So when we are forced to quit this body after a certain uh, uh, time, time duration uh, called uh, uh, Ayu, uh, the duration of life when it's over, we are forced to leave this body and at that time because we have so many plans which are incomplete or so many desires which are unfulfilled uh, what kind of desires material desires unfulfilled desires so therefore we are obliged to take birth again we are obliged to take birth again. and this birth means there is going to be death and death means for those who are not free from material desires those who are not free from material plans again birth is certain jatasya hi dhruva mrityu dhruvam janma mrityasya cha even though this is a fact most people don't realize this they are busy with their own plans and uh, uh, trying to fulfill their desires, uh, making so many different arrangements. Suddenly death comes and that is when we have to surrender. So Sri Prabhupada uh, in the purport he says, a great Indian scientist busy in the plan making business was suddenly called by invincible eternal time while going to attend a very important meeting of the planning commission. What distinguishes human life from animal life? An animal, Srila Prabhupada many times gives this example, is like a goat. Uh, Generally, they rear goats so that uh, it can be uh, its flesh uh, when it is fully grown and nicely developed its uh, uh, flesh, its body. Then it, it is generally slaughtered and uh, killed and the flesh is uh, eaten by meat eaters generally. So, this goat which is nicely uh, taken care of while it is growing and uh, fattening then eventually it is going to be killed so even when it is uh, taken for killing the goat does not realize that it is being taken for killing and even while it is waiting uh, for being killed it is fed let us say some nice green grass it is happily eating without any uh, any understanding, any, any warning and suddenly it is uh, killed for the flesh. Like that even human beings if they don't take cognizance of the fact that any time death can come and I should prepare for this death. Many people don't even know that there is something called preparation for facing death. And what is that preparation? It is to conquer this death that is possible in the human form of life. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna, he first of all explains that we are spirit soul, we are not the body. And the spirit soul, as spirit soul, every uh, person is changing the body and even at the time of death, we have to change our body, even at the time of death. So in that sense, there is no death for the spirit soul. If you consider that the soul is constantly changing body, there is no death. That means there is no annihilation of the soul. Na jayate mriyate va kadachit. 
Nayam Hanti. It is not killed. Soul is not killed. But then what is death then? Death means it is also a change of body. But if we prepare for death, that means if we prepare for the change of body at the time of death, then we can conquer death in the sense that our change of body can be such that we uh, revive our original spiritual form without having to uh, change to another material body which is again going to be destroyed in course of time. So this Punar Janma Jayaya, this is what is described as preparation for death. To, uh, to this uh, repetition of birth and death. To stop this repetition of birth and death. So in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the 12th canto, there is a nice uh, description of the four kinds of annihilation in this material existence. Very interesting. Uh, Shukadeva Goswami is describing the Parikshit Maharaj in the end of the Bhagavatam, almost the end. Uh, that uh, there are four kinds of annihilation. They are called Naimittika, Prakritika, Atyantika and Nitya. Naimittika means occasional annihilation. Prakritika means elemental annihilation. And at, sorry, Prakritika means elemental annihilation. And Atyantika means final annihilation. And uh, Nitya means constant annihilation. Four kinds of annihilation. So each one he describes, Shukadeva Goswami describes that uh, occasional or naimittika destruction or annihilation is the annihilation that takes place at the end of Brahma's day. For that it is explained one day of Brahma consists of 1000 cycles of four yugas according to our calculation on this earth. Sahasra Yuga Pariyantam Aharyat Brahmano Viduhu Brahma's day and night are of equal duration. That 12 hours of Brahma is the same as 1000 cycles of the four Yugas Satya, Treta, Dvapara, Kali on the earth planet. So within a day of Brahma called a Kalpa there are 14 Manvantaras or lifetimes of 14 Manus elapse but before the end of Brahma's day, one Kalpa. So the duration of Brahma's night is of the same uh, extent as the day of Brahma's day. So during his night, Brahma sleeps and the three planetary systems, upper, middle and lower, meet with destruction meet with destruction and all the living beings are absorbed in the body of uh, Vishnu Garbhodaka Shai Vishnu so the uh, Naimittika annihilation takes place periodically at the end of every day of Brahma. So, Brahma sleeps during his night and when he wakes up in the morning, again he is reminded by Vishnu that he has to create once again. So, sometimes people wonder after Brahma does the creation at the beginning of this universe, what work does he have after he creates? No, Brahma's work of creation happens every day. Why? Because there is destruction at the end of Brahma's day. Before Brahma's night begins, there is destruction. So, Brahma sleeps at this 
uh, during this night and again next day morning Brahma creates. Creates means Brahma has to give the bodies for all the living entities who are aligned the Again, they are given new bodies. So, this uh, creation by Brahma has to happen every single day. Every single day. So, it's not that Brahma creates only at the beginning of creation of this universe and then uh, at the end, when Brahma has to die at the end of his lifetime, so, till then what does he do? He keeps on creating every day, every day of his, he has to actually create. So, that is uh, the first kind of annihilation, naimittika, occasional, which happens at the end of Brahma's day. Then, when Brahma's lifespan of 100 years is finished, there occurs the prakritika annihilation. At this time, the seven elements of material nature, beginning with the Mahat, are all destroyed, including the universe itself, the universal shell or egg, which uh, constitutes these elements, the earth, water, fire, air, ether, uh, the false ego, the mind, the intelligence, uh, the senses, the sense objects, everything is destroyed. And they are all merged into the unmanifest uh, state of material energy, the uh, Pradhana. Hmm. So, at that time also, the living beings are absorbed into the body of Mahavishnu. Mahavishnu. So, uh, the uh, Prakritika annihilation means even the elements don't remain, they are all uh, uh, destroyed and they go back to the source, the uh, Pradhana from which they were generated at the beginning of the uh, universe. Then what is uh, described as Atyantika or final annihilation, ultimate annihilation is when a person achieves knowledge of the absolute, he understands factual reality. He perceives the entire created universe as separate from the absolute, absolute truth, separate from Krishna. And therefore, he understands it is something temporary and therefore unreal. That is called Atyantika or final annihilation, which is actually the liberation of the person from material existence itself, ultimate liberation. No more birth and death, no more uh, wandering in different uh, species or different bodies, no more change of body, no more miseries. So this is described as the Atyantika angulation. And the final one, the Nitya uh, annihilation or constant annihilation, every moment time is uh, destroying every body, every body, including every manifestation of matter, every material object. Just like this table, it is not a living being. It is a, a dead matter, object, material object, non-living object. But even this table, because of the constant annihilation effect of Kala, of time itself, it is gradually losing strength. And we know how uh, everything will become weaker and weaker and weaker, ultimately it will completely crumble. You might have sometimes heard, read in the news or even seen that some old building, dilapidated old building, how if they don't uh, demolish it, uh, 
it may completely crumble, fall apart and then people sometimes even die because they don't uh, um, take precautions to uh, evacuate from such uh, old dilapidated structures. So like that, uh, time is invisibly destroy every single material object including the material bodies of every living being. So therefore, constantly there is destruction happening which is imperceptible to all of us. This process causes uh, everyone to undergo repetition of birth and death. Birth and death. Constantly we are undergoing birth and death. That's why Krishna says, Jatasya hi dhruva mrityu, dhruva janma mrityu cha. That uh, for one who has taken birth, death is certain. And for one who dies, uh, birth is certain. So all this birth and death, due to this constant annihilation by Kala itself, imperceptible, invisible, constant annihilation. Uh, those who are having the uh, spiritual vision, uh, they can see how everyone who has taken a material body is subject to, subject to death and rebirth. Material life means subjugation to birth and death or generation and annihilation again and again and again. So, therefore, the conclusion is that there is no powerful living being within the universe who can overcome the influence of time. And everywhere around us we keep seeing so many uh, natural calamities which uh, destroy, just like when there is a cyclone, not only uh, there is destruction of so many buildings or so many properties, but even people die when there is a cyclone or an earthquake or when there is a torrential rain, suddenly there is torrential rain and then uh, some people who are not exactly prepared for it, uh, they, they die in this torrential rain or there is uh, suddenly a epidemic, outbreak of an epidemic. Just like 100 years back there was some Spanish flu. Millions of people died. In Calcutta, uh, sometime in the 1920s, there was uh, uh, a plague outbreak. And so many people died in that outbreak. So suddenly these uh, uh, natural calamities can also come and end our life in this body. So we don't uh, take note of this destructive effect of uh, Kala. So Shukade Goswami concludes this description of the four kinds of annihilation by telling that uh, The only boat suitable for crossing the ocean of material existence, which is otherwise impossible to cross, is the boat of submissive hearing of the holy name, fame, qualities and pastimes of the Supreme Lord. That is why Shukadeva Goswami, when Parikshit Maharaj asked him, uh, what is the duty of a person who is about to die? Because Parikshit Maharaj was the most intelligent king of his time. So when he got notice of death, occasioned by a curse by a Brahmana boy, so he was cursed to die within seven days and immediately he uh, uh, retired from his uh, royal duties. He handed over charge of ruling the kingdom to his uh, son. He was not exactly old. He was still 
in the middle age. But still, when he got notice of death, even he could have counteracted the curse. Uh, the untimely death he could have counteracted. He had means for doing that. But he was very intelligent in that he realized today or tomorrow or some years later I have to die. So let me prepare for death now that I have got notice of death. Let me prepare for death. So he went away to a holy place and in the association of saintly persons he began to inquire. What should I do next seven days to prepare for death so that I can be uh, successful in conquering death? All the scriptures are giving us instructions, uh, instructing us that human life is meant for conquering death. Uh, Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita as Amrutatvaya Kalpate that uh, one is eligible for immortality, immortal, eternal life uh, if we are able to conquer death and that conquering of death is possible uh, by what Parikshit did. What did Parikshit do? He inquired what is the duty of a person who is about to die. And it appears like uh, many, many saintly persons uh, before Shukadev Goswami arrived in that assembly, all other saintly persons, they were unable to give proper advice to Shukadev Goswami, uh, to Parikshit Maharaj as to what he can do next seven days, which will uh, result in Parikshit being prepared to actually quit his body and achieve ultimate uh, liberation. They said seven days is very short time. It is not enough. But when Shukadev Goswami arrived in that assembly, then Shukadev Goswami was received by Parikshit Maharaj and all the assembled saintly persons as the greatest transcendentalist of his time. And when he was uh, offered a seat of respect, then Shukadev Goswami sat and uh, uh, he began to uh, speak on the request of Parichit Maharaj. So Parichit Maharaj asked the same question to Shukadev Goswami. So Shukadev Goswami assured Parichit Maharaj first of all that seven days is plenty of time to prepare for death. If you are willing to adopt the process I am going to recommend. So Parichit was very eager to hear what is this preparation next seven days I must do for conquering death and before telling the process itself um, Shukane Goswami to assure Parikshit Maharaj seven days is plenty of time he cited the instance of one Khatwanga Rishi Khatwanga Rishi he attained perfection in just one muhurta. One muhurta is just uh, 48 minutes. Just in 48 minutes time, Khatwanga, he uh, was able to prepare himself when he came to know. He came to know that he's got a, a balance of duration of life, just uh, one muhurta. What happened was, Khatwanga's story is described uh, incident is described in the Bhagavatam by Shukadeva Goswami himself. This is Katwanga was a was very long back he was a month before Krishna. He was the emperor of the earth and then he was very expert in fighting. Therefore the Devatas once uh, wanted to take his help to conquer the Asuras and therefore the Devatas seeking his help, uh, they um, uh, uh, called him to fight against the demons and in that battle, fierce battle, Katwanga fought very, very bravely, very uh, chivalrous way 
and then the Devatas were able to win against the Asuras. As you might be aware, there is always a competition between three categories of persons who live in the upper planets for the supremacy of the uh, heavenly kingdom, Swarga Loka. Who will rule the heavenly planets and be completely um, enjoying the heavenly king's post? So there is a competition between three categories of persons in the upper planets. Who are they? The Devatas, the Asuras and the Rakshasas. So between these three categories of persons, there is always constant uh, uh, competition. So at any time, the Asuras can attack the Devatas, if the Devatas are ruling, and take charge of ruling. Uh, just like Hiranyakashipu, uh, he became very powerful by performing Tapasya, and he was uh, uh, ruling from Indra's throne, that throne of the heavenly king post. Then Bali Maharaj, once he defeated uh, uh, Indra, and uh, he was ruling from the heavenly kingdom. Uh, Ravana, he was a Rakshasa. Bali was born in the family of Asuras. He was not exactly a demon, he was a devotee. But he was born in the family of Asuras. He was ruling. Hiranyakashipu was an Asura by his nature also. And he was born in the Asura family. So he also was uh, ruling. Uh, Asura was ruling. Uh, and uh, once uh, Ravana was ruling, Ravana was uh, uh, very, very powerful and he defeated Indra and all the Devatas and he was also ruling, he was a Rakshasa. So like this, there is always competition uh, between the uh, different uh, uh, residents of the upper planets for this uh, supremacy over heaven. So uh, Indra was able to win against the attack of the Asuras by the help of Katvanga Rishi. He was a Rajarshi, of course he was a saintly king. He was a king, but he was a saintly king, just like Arjuna, the Pandavas, they were Rajarshis. So like that, he was uh, a saintly king. So he uh, helped the Devatas win, and the Devatas were very pleased at the end of the battle when they were victorious. And they all came to Katvanga to thank him, uh, and they began to uh, glorify his wonderful um, fighting ability and they began to offer him different uh, booms. So they said, uh, uh, you ask whatever you want uh, from any of the Devatas if they have the power, because different Devatas have different powers to grant some booms. So uh, they all came in front of uh, Katwanga Rishi and uh, Maharaj, and they began to offer. So Katwanga, after hearing each of them, he said, before I can ask anything from any of you, let me know one thing. What is that? How much balanced duration of time I have to live in this body? See, another sign, uh, a sign of another very, very intelligent king. Very intelligent king, just like Parikshit Maharaj. Katwanga Rishi also was, Katwanga Maharaj was very, very intelligent. So he asked this question, so they did some calculation and said, You just have one Murta time, that's all. 48 minutes. So immediately Katwanga Rishi, Katwanga Maharaj said, I don't want any of your benedictions. What will I do with them? So he immediately left that place. Uh, went to a, a holy place and sat in meditation upon the Supreme Lord Krishna within his heart. Obviously, he had practiced this earlier and he was conscious that before death comes, I should completely be fixed in meditation on Krishna. My mind should be fixed on Krishna. And therefore, 48 minutes time, he simply sat in meditation on Krishna within his heart, which obviously he had practiced earlier. And in this way, being completely absorbed 
in meditation on Krishna, thought of Krishna, he quit his body when death came and he straight went back to God. You see, successfully he has uh, conquered death by preparing very intelligently whatever balance time was there. So, uh, citing this instance of Khatvanga Maharaj, uh, Swami assured that if you can fix your uh, mind upon Krishna and simply by remaining absorbed in uh, thinking of Krishna, mind fixed on Krishna. Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita Antakale Chamadiva Smaran Muktva Kalevra Yaprayati Samadhavam Yatina Atra Samshaya or Mayeva Mana Adatswa, Mai Buddhin Niveshaya, Nivachishisi Mayeva, Atta Udvam Nasamshaya. So many places Krishna describes in the Bhagavad Gita. Fix your mind upon me always. Always think of me. Man Mana Bhava. Ma Manusmara. Tasma Sarveshu Kaleshu. Ma Manusmara. Always think of me all the time. So, um, even if one is not able to always think of Krishna, if one has practiced remembering Krishna while executing one's other duties, so then there is notice of death. For somebody who is very, very alert, there is notice of death. Just like Vidura is now going to describe the Uttar Krashtra, there is already notice of death for you. The approaching of old age symptoms of old age is notice of death. So, you should be preparing for uh, fixing your mind upon Krishna to actually face death. And what are you doing? You are simply trying to enjoy some royal comforts uh, which uh, Yudhishthira has very kindly offered to you out of uh, uh, respect for you, out of uh, uh, gratitude towards you as you are uh, uh, nephew, he has uh, been very kind and gracious to offer you all these uh, uh, nice facilities, but you are completely forgetful of your responsibility uh, that what are you supposed to do before death comes? You are completely forgetful. So he's reminding, death is going to come and suddenly you will have to quit the body. Are you, are you ready for it? So that uh, warning uh, uh, Vidura is given. So, uh, great personalities like Parikshit Maharaj, Khatvanga Rishi, and all great transcendentalists, they are actually very conscious of the fact that before death comes, we should actually be preparing ourselves to actually fix our mind upon Krishna. And for fixing the mind upon Krishna, there are so many different uh, methods of which the best method is the method of Bhakti Yoga. Because in Bhakti Yoga what happens? One naturally develops a attraction, a attachment to Krishna by practice of Bhakti. The whole practice of Bhakti is to purify our consciousness, to awaken that natural attraction for Krishna which is already there in our heart. As you would have heard many times earlier, each one of us, we have got an eternal relationship with the Supreme Lord Krishna in His kingdom, in His personal abode. We belong to that abode of Krishna and we are many in the struggle for existence in this world. So to end this, Krishna is uh, teaching us in the Bhagavad Gita that uh, simply specific understanding uh, is possible by purification of our material misconceptions. So by practicing Bhakti Yoga, we are able to purify the heart and understand and realize who we are, realize who is Krishna. And what is my relationship? And then by actually constantly engaging 
in uh, devotional service to Krishna even before that comes. Practicing this, specifically this chanting of the holy name of Krishna, especially in the form of this Hare Krishna mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. We are able to actually uh, uh, prepare ourselves and that we will see how uh, Vidura will instruct uh, the Trashtra very nicely about uh, uh, preparing for this uh, uh, death, impending death which will come all of a sudden and uh, not only that one has to surrender his life at the time of death but one has to surrender everything else connected with this body uh, the possessions we are so much attached to material possessions uh, that uh, we have to give up uh, that is another thing we don't realize though we know that we cannot take anything with us when death comes nobody can take anything uh, with them when they when they have to quit the body but uh, somehow we uh, forget this essential fact that all our possessions we have to give up at the time of death, including the body itself, which we have to give up. So that also uh, Vidura is reminding. Pranay priyatamay rapi janasadyo vijjeta kim utanye dhanadidhi. What to speak of the other possessions, wealth or honor or children or land or house or whatever be the possessions, everything we have to give up. When we give up our body itself, everything in connection with the body. This is very nicely described in the Bhagavatam as Aham Mameti, this misconception that I am this body, Aham. Aham, this feeling of I am this body, this misunderstanding. That is where material existence begins. Birth in this material world entails this uh, misunderstanding of and this body. And as a result of this uh, misconception, uh, when I think I am this body, then obviously the body has some connection with uh, bodily relatives. Just like uh, generally one takes birth uh, from mother and father. So identify so and so as my mother and then so and so as my father. And then uh, the relationships uh, in connection with father and mother, brother, sister, uncle, aunt, so many relationships. And the possessions in relation to the body, uh, my clothes, my house, uh, my uh, wealth, my whatever possessions. So like this we develop mama, aham and mama. Aham mama iti. This is the whole uh, trap of the illusory energy to completely mislead us into thinking I am this body which I am not, which nobody is. Uh, and uh, the bodily connections uh, as mine based on the body. My father, my mother, my uh, possessions, my wealth, my honor, even things like uh, uh, false prestige. Uh, so many, so many things. My uh, position, uh, position, my honor, respect in society, and so many things. All this we become attached, and consequently, when death comes, this attachment is going to be a big obstacle uh, for us to actually um, give up all these things. We are forced to give up and it's a very, very painful <coughs> uh, situation. Being forced to give up something which we don't want to give up because we are very attached. And then the fear that accompanies, the traumatic uh, fear fearful situation because I don't know what is going to happen to me, where am I going, uh, how will I live or exist without my 
uh, near and dear ones, without my possessions, without any, without even a body. How am I going to live? Gross body. So it is a very, very fearful situation for somebody who is in ignorance or somebody who is not prepared. Therefore, the scriptures say, prepare for death before death comes by becoming spiritually enlightened. <clears throat> spiritual enlightenment is the only way. And that spiritual enlightenment is not possible by our ordinary education system. Uh, nobody is educated about this realities of life uh, in the regular uh, universities and schools and colleges, unfortunately. The education system is not uh, teaching the most essential thing. So the scriptures are giving us this most important knowledge, Brahma Vidya, spiritual understanding, spiritual knowledge. And that's why it's so important that people should uh, <clears throat> uh, cultivate this knowledge side by side, along with uh, getting some knowledge about uh, material uh, things for the sake of uh, maintaining this body or earning a livelihood. Yes, that is required, but uh, that is not enough. That is not enough. That is uh, not going to help us to face uh, death and the consequent uh, traumatic, uh, fearful situation. And we are forced to be separated from everything uh, that we know of as I or mine. Uh, and be forced to be uh, to force to give up. So instead of uh, facing that uh, situation being unprepared, in ignorance, unenlightened, so we should uh, become enlightened by uh, hearing, most important process of hearing from uh, the proper sources about these facts. So Bhagavatam is full of uh, such instances of great personalities either themselves showing by their own example or instructing others for others' benefit. What is this uh, death and how to, what happens in death actually and how to prepare for death and what is that uh, preparation and what is that knowledge we have to get and also not only just acquiring knowledge in terms of the uh, theory or the information, but also uh, realizing that and living a life based on this understanding, that is even more uh, challenging, bigger challenge than just um, merely the matter of understanding this, uh, this uh, truths or these facts. It's not just understanding, it's also realizing. So some practices are essential, some spiritual practices. So the easiest and the most recommended process uh, is uh, this uh, chanting and hearing of the holy name of the Supreme Lord, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare. Stop.